All right, guys. So um, let's start talking about what our strategy is going to be for exploiting SCH overflow and getting past death and um, GS protection and all that other kind of nastiness. So to do this, we always have to rely on like one weak module. This is generally a necessity unless you have like an information leak bug. So um, those are sort of the two avenues you can take here is that one is you're abusing a weak DLL like we're going to do with Flash. Or you can use a uh, information disclosure bug to figure out what the state of the stack is or figure out where some processes, where some functions are located. But um, we're not going to take that route. I've, apparently, the rumor is any sort of bug that allows you to gain control of EIP can be massaged into an information disclosure bug. But um, a lot of times, I think it's easier to abuse these weak modules where we know exactly what their address range is going to be. Like in Windows 7, even with ASLR, Flash will be loaded at this address. And um, does not have state SCH turned on, so we can return to any of its code if we overwrite the extension handler. So Flash is the little um, person we're going to beat up on today. Okay. So in terms of GS protection, don't care about that. We already know how to get past it. We're just going to, instead of overriding the return address, override the exception handler. We'll gain control of VIP before that uh, stack canary is ever checked. Um, when we gain control of VIP, we're going to call virtual protect. We're going to change the permissions on the page where our shell code exists to be executable. And then we're going to return to our shell code. So it sounds pretty simple in theory, right? There's actually like a lot of little annoying things that will come up along the way. That I'm sure you all discover and enjoy. Um, okay. So since we're going to bypass GS protection, we're going to overwrite the exception handler. Um, the problem is when we gain control of EIP via an exception handler overwrite, we do not have control of the stack pointer. ESP is pointing at um, not attacker controlled data. So I can actually show this. Let's see here. It's my kind of run SCH overflow again. And I'm just going to set the uh, address of the exception handler equal to a breakpoint function. Just because I want to show you guys where the stack is pointing when we get control of EIP via an exception handler override. So I'm going to use just this one right here, I guess. Zero four zero one four nine C. Okay. All right, so um, at this point, this is the exact point we've gained control of EIP. And for return-oriented programming to work, we have to control the stack pointer. It's like the most important part of return-oriented programming. The stack and the return instructions are the glue that holds all of the code together that we want to chain together. So right now, ESP points to 12S6B8. And look at that. It's not any of our data, right? Because um, We've overwritten the stack with dead beef and other stuff. And none of this is dead beef, so ESP is not pointing anywhere close to where our data is at. And we have to make ESP point to our data 
because when a return instruction executes, we need to continue to control EIP. If a return instruction executed right now, we would not control EIP because it would just pop this value off the stack and put it into EIP. Okay, so the program we're going to be using, I've actually put into, um, I've turned on some extra mitigations and put it in a different directory. It's in SDH Overflow Hardened. And so this is the one that we'll actually be um, attacking for today. Not the original one, but this one, because I've recompiled it with some additional uh, mitigations turned on. like safe SCH and GS and all that business. And what I want you to do is um, kind of do what I just did. Develop a payload that overrides the exception handler with the uh, address of an OXCC byte and a flash binary so that it will break when you gain control of EIP and that exception handler is processed will break. I want you to look at where ESP is and I want you to figure out what the delta is, what the difference is between where ESP is pointing now when you gain control of EIP and where your actual data is. Tell me how big that gap is. Does that make sense, what I'm asking you guys to do? We need to reboot into depth. Yes, uh, everyone, if you haven't already, reboot into depth. Notice depth won't stop us from doing that because we're just returning the code that already exists that smart presenting to you. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the process of trying to get to where you guys are on my screen if anyone wants to follow along that um, feels confused at this point. At this point, I'm just running it with a file full of uh, 2048 bytes of dead beef because I just want to calculate again the offset to the file where we're writing that um, exception handler function pointer. Or the FFP0? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's just the first exception handler that we're going to overwrite. So what I'm going to do now is just um, Overwrite those with some placeholder values to make sure I am demonstrating control over EIP. So now I just need to find a CC byte to point it at. I need it to be in um, the flash binary since uh, I believe state SCH should be turned on and everything else. We can check it gnarly.
Okay, so the address I found for the flash CC bike that I'm using, if anyone is following along with what I'm doing, it's at Then once you got to this point, you should go look to where ESP is pointing. Try to figure out where your data is. Figure out the difference between the two. Find is um, the deltas for the absolute difference. So, like the delta for the, from the start of your data and the delta to the end of your data. So, you should find, find x such that ESP plus x equals start of attacker data. Find want to be sure that everyone understands why it's important that the stack points at attacker data so everyone understand why that's important. We have to make sure when those return instructions execute that we maintain control of EIP. We do not control ESP. We will not maintain control of EIP across return instructions. The stack is the glue that's going to work on it chain all these pieces of code together with. So we have to have that glue. Now when you have a typical stack overflow, you maintain, you have control of ESP by default because ESP will end up pointing um, right above that saved return address that you corrupted and that will all be stuff that you've overwritten so you'll automatically have control over ESP. With these exception handler overrides, you do not automatically have control for ESP. So we're going to need to get control of it somehow. So you guys can, uh, curious who has the answer to these questions. This is the easiest question. Just any Z 
such that ESP plus Z equals attack or control data. And the harder questions are what are X and Y, so these are in the absolute limits of the attack or control. Does anyone have an answer yet? So these are the questions you should be asking yourself. So, I'll write down what Zeno got here. We'll see if other people got the same thing. Has anyone else got some answers? Can they confirm what Zeno found? So here's what I would do to figure out these answers for anyone who wants to follow along with me. I already know what the address of buff is because I broke on that called the F read, and I know it's going to be the start of my attacker data. So I know my attacker data starts at 13FB6C. So I can just do some math here in WinDebug to tell me what the answer to X is. With uh, 1, 3, FB, 6, C, minus ESP. So I get 4 AC, the same as Zeno. Now I figure out what the limits of uh, <coughs> that is. So I remember correctly from yesterday, the buffer we were overflowing was like 1,024 bytes. So I, I know at least up to 1,024 is going to have the attacker data. So I'll just start looking manually. So then 13 FB 60 plus 1024. Oh, it's hexadecimal. So that's uh, oh, it's 400. Is that right? Okay, so still attacker data there. One three. EC. Okay, and so with FC plus 4, I no longer have attacker data, so I'll just say uh, FC in my calculation. So yeah, Zeno just took the next one, but it doesn't matter. The next four bytes. Yeah, I started from 1,400, which or 140,000, which is what the bang tab displays as the last address, or the start, end of the stack. Yeah, I mean it. Um, it doesn't too much matter the very outer limits because we'll actually want to pivot this the stack into like the middle or beginning of the attacker control data. That way we have more room for a return-oriented version and payload. If we were to put ESP, make ESP point to like right here, um, that could be problematic because then we don't have this much bytes for our return-oriented programming payload and our big stack frames that we're going to create the verbal protect call. 
but I just want you to guys have a general idea of what the limits are. Okay, so here's the next step of the lab. We have to make ESP point to attacker controlled data and then immediately return. The return will allow us to maintain control of uh, EIP, so like point EIP at the next uh, address that we want. And the add, the add ESP for making ESP point to our data is uh, important for reasons I've already described. It allows us to continue to maintain control of EIP when multiple returns are executed. So <coughs> what we need to do is find a series of instructions that make ESP equal to our data. Then execute a return. So essentially what we have to find is a function of the form If we were to point the exception handler function pointer at something described by these constraints, we would point ESP into attacker controlled data and then gain control of EIP again. So we control the stack and EIP, which is exactly what we need for return oriented programming. So this is what I want you guys to try to find. And this has to be, I should be more clear, So what we're looking for here is a stack pivot. Generally, the first thing you want to do when you gain control of EIP and uh, when you're trying to bypass mitigations is pivot the stack. Find some sort of stack pivot instruction that allows us to gain control of ESP so we can start executing return on the program. So you can uh, search flash So you have to figure out what bytes it is you're actually searching for. And I want you guys to try to figure that out as well. So the command to search flash is I'll put this in that notepad file too for you guys to have. So what I would do, guys, is I would figure out what are the bytes for add ESP some like 32-bit value or something like that, and search for those. And I would make sure what I find also ends in C3. It's going to have to end in C3. But I would do that by just starting to search for add ESPX and look at the output to make sure that the output I find ends in C3 because it's going to have to end in that return instruction so we may maintain control of EIP. You got one? 
All right, so what, what address is it for what you found? 10086D6A. Sounds promising, what I remember from the last class. So this is what uh, Dave found. Something that does add ESP878 in return. And right now I'm still broken at that point where gain control is on EIP. So let's do DD ESP plus 878 because that's what a stack would point to after that instruction executes. And look at that, attacker data. Now why don't you describe how, how you uh, found that, Dave? So search for um, 81C4. And how did you figure out 81C4? Assembly yep. something. So this is exactly what I would do. I would do, all right, well I know I need to do an add ESP, so I'll do uh, a assemble mode add ESP 100, just give it a legitimate offset. when you both stop reading out here in a second. Okay, so I can see using the A command that the bytes for add ESP are 81C4 in like a 32-bit value to add. So I can see like my 100 here, 1000 or 0100 rather. So 81C4 are the bytes for uh, add ESP. So what I'll do is I'll search flash The trick here is, what were you looking for, Dave, in this output when you were trying to find the answer? Big number. Yep. And what else? C3. C3. That's right. So you want these numbers to be to match this criteria, you know, this range, bigger than 4AC and less than 940, and it has to be followed by C3. So it's not that much output. Let's see. Too small. Too small. 0480. Um, that is just too small, I think. Yep. B2C. Um, let's see, is that might be too big? Yeah, too big. 878. There's our winner. And then we also have some ones, and see, it's followed by a return instruction, then 0600. This might work as well. So we have. Definitely some um, different choices here, but uh, Dave's one works just fine. I think it's the one of the last class shows actually, but I believe these, these 600s work as well. Just so you can verify that it all looks right, you can do disassemble on that address, U1108E410, at ESP600, is that ESP for us? And Dagger Dave too, so that's good too. But since Dave found that one, we can use that one. Hopefully it won't come back and uh, hurt us. Only time will tell. Does anyone have any questions about what it was we were just looking for or how we found it? Everyone be okay with that? 
Does everyone understand why we are looking for this stack pivot? Do you understand the general process I just went through to find it? Now, obviously, using WinDebug to search for this is uh, not great because WinDebug doesn't support regular expressions and so forth. But it's pretty easy to, you know, write a small disassembly script to look for stuff like this in the DLL. And I can actually provide you guys one that I've written myself uh, at the end of class. For now, I want you guys to learn how to do it in WinDebug because we should all get better at WinDebug. How good you, how good you are at WinDebug will greatly determine or greatly help how easy it is to develop exploits like this. How good you are developing exploits is basically directly correlated to how good you are at debugging. So getting good at debugging is helpful, of course. OK. So here's what I want you guys to do next. Change the exception handler function pointer you're using. Currently, it should be pointing to that CC byte to point to this. All right? And then locate in the file what particular part of the file it will use for that return instruction. What part of the file will end up in EIP? So after you do that, add ESP. Um, 800 or whatever it was, ESP is going to be pointing somewhere in here. And then when it sets the return instruction, does the return instruction kind of set EIP equal to one of these values? I want you guys to figure out exactly what offset it is into the file where that is occurring. Once you think you have an answer, try to demonstrate control by changing that part of your file, like A, 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 and make sure after your stack pivot happens, you end up with EIP equals A, 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 whatever value you put there. So here's how I would calculate this, guys. Okay, so I'm going to use 878 since that's what you guys found. What I'm going to do is set a breakpoint on that address, on the address of my uh, stack pivot, so that when I begin executing my stack pivot, I'll have a you know, the debugger will be in control. And I can start looking at stuff. Also, I want to uh, verify the address of my buffer because I know the address of my buffer will represent like offset zero into my file my payload. Okay, so that's still the same, 13FB6C. Just wanted to show you again how I got it. 13FB6C. Got it the same method before when I wrote it down. Oops. 
They did not change the address. On payload, let me do that now. Um, one zero six A six D zero eight zero. Just make sure I set the breakpoint right. Yeah, sure. Okay. So Just going to write down some stuff I know in this window. I know the address of my buffer is this. And where is ESP going to point to after this line executes? Let's do a single step to find out. Oops. Okay. So that's an attacker data. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so, I think the difference between ESP is pointing now and the address of the address of my buffer. That's the offset I get into my file, 3 cc. And so I can try to verify if that's actually correct. by changing that offset in my file to a placeholder value and making sure EIP equals that placeholder value. And what I'm going to do just to give myself some wiggle room is put some placeholder values around it as well. So I'll do AA B's here. So if my math was exactly right, EIP should equal B, 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 B since that is offset 3CC in my file. But in case I was a little bit off, a little bit in here, placeholder values all around. Restart. So at this point I've demonstrated that after my stack pivot, my EIP will point at offset um, 3cc into the file. Those of you that are getting slightly different offsets but using the same pivot is probably because you're naming your file that you're putting your payload in differently and the, your, your command line parameters end up on the stack and it can shift stuff around a little bit on the stack. Now, if you wanted to give yourself some real wiggle room and effectively put like a no-op in here, does anyone have any idea of what we would put around here instead of no-ops if we wanted something to act like a no-op in this return-oriented programming world? If we weren't exactly sure what our offsets were. So in return-oriented programming, a no-op is effectively a return instruction. So if we were to fill everything in this area with the return instruction, with the address of a return instruction rather, it would end up somewhere in our return oriented programming knob sled. Do a return, 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 just to keep increasing the stack pointer basically, return, 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 until finally we get to what we really want to have the value of EIP for. So in this case, you can just be absolutely precise and not use any return-oriented programming, any ROP knobs. But um, that is what you could do to effectively like give yourself some padding in this area if you're not exactly sure where you're going to end up in your payload file.
So before we um, move on, I want to make sure that everyone can demonstrate control of EIP after that stack pivot occurs. And everyone knows what offset in their file is actually um, being popped into EIP after the stack pivot. Everyone here have that? Okay, so I'm going to walk through how I did this, guys. So anyone that's lost, uh, try to follow along. First thing I'm going to do is set a breakpoint on my call to F read. That way I can see what the address of my buffer is. If I know the address of my buffer, it's going to represent offset zero in my file. Because it starts reading in the beginning of the file and putting it in the beginning of the buffer. So I want to know what that address is. So I'm just going to do like a run decursor to get there. And looking at the stack right before the call to F read, I can see that my buffer is located at 13 FP6C. Can I copy that value? And next I want to see where the stack pointer ends up after I perform that stack pivot that Dave found for us. So, where was that stack pivot again? 10086B6A. Is that right, guys? Mm -hmm. And I go up to um, the point where we start executing my stack pivot. So after this, add ESP878, it's going to point at attacker data. It's not really sure where in my file that represents. So I'll do T. And now ESP is pointing at attacker data, but I want to know exactly where my attacker data it is. So I'm going to do the difference between ESP and where my buffer starts, 13 fb 6 c I can see that this means that ESP is now pointing at effectively offset 3 CC into my file. So if I were to change that in my file to a placeholder value like B's or A's or C's or whatever, I should eventually see that EIP equals service. So who um, who knows what address we're going to put here? What's the next thing we want to do effectively? Yep. Well, we'll want to point it to some sort of instruction that disables step. That's right. So we're actually going to um, the very next thing we execute is going to be virtual protect. Virtual protect is a kernel 32 function that allows us to change the memory permissions on pages of memory. We can make them executable or writable or whatever. 